I'd like to welcome you all to the Ivy Idea Forum, a regular speaker series for our alumni and other executives. This is our first event for 2016, and today we are pleased to have a panel of high-profile executives to discuss the importance of leader character, what undermines it, and how to develop it. We'll start this discussion in a moment, but first I'd like to outline the format for this session this morning. I'll start by giving a brief overview of the book Developing Leadership Character, and we then will engage in a Q&A with the panelists until around 9 a.m. You will have then the opportunity to, have, uh, to ask questions from 9 till around 9.25. Uh, the session is being recorded, so we ask that you use the microphones when you ask your questions. You'll find a survey uh, at your seat, and we would very much appreciate if you can uh, fill it out before you leave at the end of the session. It's important to us, uh, helps us plan for future IVID forums and to better uh, meet uh, your needs. Uh, last, if you're interested in purchasing, purchasing copies of the book, uh, please see the information on the, on the Plasma screens. It has a promo code which gives you a nice discount on any purchased book. We've also drawn some names and we'll give away some, uh, some copies of the book uh, to those winners at the end of the session. Before we turn it over to the panel, let me just say uh, a few things about uh, the book, uh, Developing Leadership uh, Character. Uh, the work actually started in, uh, in 2008, 2009, when certainly at Ivy, we were given a great gift, uh, namely the financial crisis. And the former dean of the Ivy Business School, Carol Stevenson, uh, taught me a very valuable lesson, is that you never waste a good crisis. <laughs> and clearly, at the school, we are asking a lot of questions about you know, how did this actually happen, and specifically, what's the role of leadership in all of this, because quite frankly, many of the people at the epicenter of it all were presumed to be the best and brightest that had gone to the best business schools in the world and so forth. And yet on their watch, this crisis was unfolding. How did this happen? And of course, as we all know, people offered explanations like greed and the Canadian regulatory system. But for all kinds of explanations, these explanations were kind of unsatisfactory to, uh, to us. And so we engaged in a large-scale project, uh, Jeffrey Gans, Mary Crossan, Carol Stevenson, and myself, and we began to ask ourselves uh, a number of questions that ended up first in uh, a, a research paper, kind of a discussion paper, right? And so could good leadership have made uh, a difference, or was this simply an act of mother nature? And the answer, of course, is yes, of course it could have made a big difference. All right. Uh, what do we know about good leadership and what did we, both scholars as well as practitioners, individuals in the public, the private, and the not-for-profit sectors, miss about the formulations of good leadership? Because presumably we missed something, that right? leadership didn't work. Right? Third question, how did business schools contribute to the crisis right, in business leadership? You know, as I said earlier, many of these people went to the best business schools of the world. How did we contribute? Were particular courses missing? Did we direct, redirect people in a particular direction? You know, it was a great opportunity for many business schools, including the Ivy Business School, to kind of open up the kimono, so to speak, and do a lot of self-reflection. And then fourth, and perhaps most important, what do institutions, again, both business schools as well as business organizations, need to do or need to do different in order to prevent these kinds of crises from happening again? And so what we did, as I said, we formulated our initial thoughts in kind of a, a, a paper, and that provided really a starting point for a lot of conversations with people in the public, the private, and the not-for-profit sectors. Uh, at the end of the day, we uh, had uh, very close uh, conversations with over 350 very senior leaders uh, in Canada, the United States, uh, the UK, and, uh, and Hong <coughs> Kong. And that culminated in the book, uh, Leadership and Trial, a Manifesto for Leadership Development. It's about an 80-page book. I think it's uh, clearly written, lots of learning. But, you know, the one key sentence uh, has driven our research program ever since. And that sentence is simply as follows. Competencies count, character matters, and commitment to the role of leadership is critical to individual and organizational success. Now, competencies are relatively straightforward. Right? The things that leaders should be able to do, competencies, right? 
Commitment, I think, is relatively easy to understand as well. Are you committed to the role of leadership? I know that many of us love to lead. We may enjoy the perks that come with the role of leadership. But it was very clear right, from the conversations that many individuals were not prepared to do the hard work of leadership. They like to wear the crown or the tiara, but they were not always prepared to do the hard work of leadership, not always deeply engaged in what was happening in the organization, not always listening to the whispers as to the concerns that people had about you know, the downsides of these very complex financial products. Intuitively, people got that as well. What surprised us the most, though, in all these conversations that we had with those leaders was the passion with which people talked about leader character. Now, this was uh, a bit challenging because the other thing that we noticed was there was no kind of agreement as to what uh, character or leader character meant. And after some soul searching with kind of the research team, we conceptualized leader character as this amalgam of virtues, values, and traits. And character really speaks to who individuals are, right? And so virtues, those are simply those behaviors that are seen as worthwhile, right? They, they benefit individual well-being or well-being of organizations and society. Things like justice and courage and judgment or wisdom are all examples, right, of virtues. Some of the values, right, are very virtuous in nature, things like transparency. And then certain personality traits, like conscientiousness or resiliency, are very virtuous in nature as well. So that's how we, ever since 2010, when we came out with this report, treat this notion around leader character. Now the point that we have made, uh, continue to make, is that these are the three critical C's of good leadership. Right? And if any one of those is missing or deficient, that will simply undermine the other two C's. So you can say, well, I have great competencies, I have wonderful character, but without the commitment, there will be suboptimal results. And if you doubt perhaps that statement, I would urge you to simply think about Lehman Brothers or SNC Lavalin <coughs> or Volkswagen, which I don't think was a crisis of competencies or commitment. Right? It was a real issue around kind of the leader character. So two out of three ain't enough. We really need to work on all three, including this notion around leader character. Um, but, you know, quite frankly, um, of those three Cs, competency, character, and commitment, character has received by far right, the least attention, both in organizations, for sure, at academic institutions, both in terms of the research as well as uh, the teaching. And yet this is somewhat ironic because if we think about some very contemporary leaders, oftentimes we think about their leader character or who they are that made them so effective or perhaps ineffective. So there's a real disconnect between what we say is important and what we actually see happening in organizations, right? And so then the question was, what kind of explains that disconnect, right, between uh, the actual use and people talking about it in, uh, in organizations? And again, in our close conversations with leaders from the public, the private, and not-for-profit sector, there were three immediate explanations, right? The first one is simply that character is a very loaded word, right? If I tell one of my colleagues, you know, I really doubt your character, people become a little defensive because of its very subjective nature, right? Which leads us to the second point is that there was no real language or a vocabulary with which to address leader character or the deficiencies of leader character in the workplace. And if there's no language, people might say it's too much of a hot button issue. I prefer not to address it in performance management conversations, leadership development profiles, and so forth. And then thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, you know, there's very few tools available, all right, for the systematic assessment of leader character. And the point is that if we would like to go from talking about leader character to actually do something about it in the workplace, then we need these tools or these reflection exercises to really make a difference. And so that was kind of at 2010 when we published the leadership and trial, uh, a real challenge, right? Uh, sounds wonderful, competencies count, character matters and commitment to the role of leadership is critical, but people had so many questions. So where did that leave us? Well, 
in a very difficult spot, right? And, uh, and quite frankly, many of those leaders that we interacted with were looking at the IV Business School and the research team for some real compelling answers. And so for the past five, six years, we've been trying to give people those answers. And uh, as it says on the, uh, on, on the PowerPoint here, I cannot emphasize that enough. We really have had, uh, received a lot of help from, from actual uh, leaders, which have been a great benefit to, uh, to us. <coughs> Countless focus groups with very senior executives in organizations. Uh, too many invited uh, presentations, right, that allowed us to really test our ideas, which we thought were based on good scholarship, but what we believe, what we think, does it actually resonate with people, right, in, in, in real organizations. In the old days, as, as, as academics, as scholars, we had to go to organization and, and, and actually begging them for data collection. This time was just the opposite. People said, that's an interesting talk. Um, if you need any data, please let us know. And so we seized on that opportunity as, uh, as well. We were very fortunate to work with the Institute of Corporate Directors. Corporate directors, individuals at the highest level in the organizations to engage in a research program across, across Canada. Fabulous data. And finally, we partnered with uh, Sigma Assessment that allowed us to actually develop one of these tools, these instruments to assess uh, leader character and actually use it in, uh, in organization, right? So this actually provided the language, um, uh, the vocabulary that was so necessary for the assessment and ongoing development of leaders in, the, in organizations. So yes, there is a language, and yes, leadership character can be measured. So all of that research then led to this uh, particular uh, framework. And by the way, if in the back you can't read it, don't worry. Uh, we'll send the, uh, the PDF of this file to you. But the important thing here to understand is that through our research, again, with deep involvement of leaders in the public, the private, and not-for-profit sector, we have identified 11 uh, virtues uh, that we call dimensions, right? So drive, collaboration, humanity, humility, integrity. Temperance, justice, accountability, courage, transcendence, and judgment. In those circles, you see a number of behavioral manifestations, character elements, or character strengths, right? Those are the behaviors that are illustrative of this particular dimension. So if you think about humanity, for example, that simply means that people bring a certain amount of consideration, they demonstrate empathy, they're compassionate, magnanimous, and very forgiving, right? So those are simply behaviors that are illustrative. Now, a couple of things about this framework, and in the interest of time, I will limit myself to three, what I think are three important observations, right? We elaborate on that in the book in a, in a great amount of detail. As I said, each of those dimensions is, um, is, uh, is operationalized by a number of these, these, these character elements. And the easier it is for you to demonstrate those behaviors, the easier it is for individuals to activate that particular character dimension, what we call strength of character. Sometimes people say, you know what, uh, my strength really is in, uh, in drive and accountability and courage, and for me that's good enough. Uh, we say that's the worst mistake that you can make. All of these 11 are non-negotiable. All of them are relevant, and here is why. Say, for example, we want people to act with candor, and quite frankly, we hear candor and the importance of candor in, in, candor in organizations. We hear that a lot. This is an example of integrity. Of course we would like people to act with candor and integrity in organizations. But you and I know that to act with candor and to engage in candid conversations for most of us is extremely challenging. You really need a certain amount of courage to do that. I know very few people who wake up on Thursday morning and say, I'm going to have a candid conversation with this individual and he is going to get demoted. It doesn't work like that. You need candor, <coughs> but it requires courage as well. And then, of course, candor should never mean that it is these conversations are mean-spirited. Right? They always need to you know, take place with a certain amount of compassion right, or understanding. And so that's the notion around humanity. So in many ways, they work together. I'll give you another example, financial industry, maybe Icelandic bankers, Lehman Brothers, incredible drive on the part of individuals. Yet it wasn't complemented with a good amount of temperance. So drive without temperance oftentimes lead to reckless behavior. And we've seen a lot of that in organizations 
as well. And hence this notion that you know, they're non-negotiable, they're interconnected, they work together to drive sound decision-making and action, which leads to a third point in that as leaders, we really should strive, and this is an ambitious, obje um, ambitious objective, to really develop all 11 character dimensions. But for most of us, that might prove to be a very challenging exercise, but not one that we should shy away from. All right, so keep that uh, in mind. Okay, so that then brings me to, uh, to the book, all right, Developing Leadership uh, Character. In a nutshell, I wanna go to the panel very quickly. Uh, we make the point that we see uh, character as a key differentiator in, uh, in good leadership, and it's what truly differentiates one leader from the other. And so in the book, we really present our ongoing leadership on, on leader character. We go back to leadership and trial. We talk about the findings about the importance of leader character. We unpack in a great amount of detail each of those character dimensions as well as the character elements. We provide behavioral examples. It's not uh, an overly academic book. It's not an overly practitioner book either. I think it's a nice blend where we make things come alive. We articulate in a fair amount of detail how the various dimensions are interrelated or interconnected. We offer a lot of reflective questions and a tool to self-diagnose how we measure up in terms of those 11 dimensions and the supporting character elements. I think one of the nice features of the book is that we provide a lot of resources in terms of readings, uh, clips, TED Talks, and what, uh, and what have you. And finally, and perhaps most important, we end the book almost with kind of prescriptive advice. If this is so important, then what is it then that leaders as well as organizations need to stop doing, start doing, or consider doing different to elevate the importance of leader character to the same level as the competencies that are seen as so important in organizations? And so the audiences or the intended audience is really threefold, right? As I said, for uh, current and, uh, and, uh, and future leaders to better understand and appreciate the importance of leader character, and I hope that in the book uh, we make that case in a very compelling fashion. I would say the second audience, of course, is people in leadership and organizational development, HR professionals, right? Because what is it that they can be doing in terms of implementing HR systems that would really reinforce or help shape the character that is necessary to become a successful leader. And then the third audience, quite frankly, is uh, business schools or other schools, because let's be honest, this notion around leader character should not be confined to simply business students, but also individuals in engineering, in medicine, uh, the sciences, and so forth. And so what is it that they should know about character and leader character uh, development? So that's kind of the intended objective of the, uh, of the book. Which then leads me to, to the panel. It would not be fun for me here to kind of give uh, you know, all that there is to know, need to know about, uh, about the book, but uh, let's make uh, things come alive. So I wanna take uh, a minute to, to introduce our, our panel for, uh, for this morning and then fire off a, a number of questions uh, to them, all right? So um, on my immediate left, right, uh, we have Dean Connor. Uh, Dean is president and chief executive officer of Sun Life Financial and is a member of the company's board of directors. He joined Sun Life in 2006 as executive vice president with responsibility for the company's UK and reassurance operations, strategic international activities and corporate functions. And Dean is a graduate of our HBA 1978 class. 78, wow. Oh, 78. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Dean. All right. Thank you. Then in the middle, we have Rob Brower. Uh, Rob is Canadian Managing Partner, Clients and Markets for KPMG and Vice Chair of the Institute of Corporate Directors. He has more than 30 years of experience as an audit partner and senior relationship partner for a wide range of public and private companies uh, with operations in Canada and internationally. And so, welcome Rob. Thank you. And then to my far left, to your right, is Cynthia Devine, who is the Chief uh, Financial Officer of Rio Can Real Estate Investment Trust, a position she has held since March of 2015. Rio Can is Canada's largest retail investment trust with ownership and management of Canada's largest portfolio of shopping centers. And prior to this role, Cynthia was the CFO of Tim Hortons and she's a graduate of the HBA 1987 class. So welcome, Cynthia. Thanks. 
So here's what we've done. I have prepared a, a series of questions. I uh, sent them to the participants uh, in advance so that we get some thoughtful answers on some of the, what I hope are uh, somewhat provocative or interesting uh, questions. So maybe I can ask this question to the entire panel. Um, what's your reaction, what's your initial reaction to the book and is there one particular message that stands out for you the most? Sure. Uh, good morning everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm not just saying it because Gerard is standing uh, about uh, 10 feet to my <laughs> right, but I did thoroughly <laughs> enjoy the book. We received it in late December, uh, so I, I kind of started opening it up in January, which was right around the time of year end. Uh, so I was busy with a lot of priorities, but I actually just enjoyed every night reading a different chapter. And it's not, nothing, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't uh, read something and say, wow, that never dawned on me that I needed integrity, um, you know, to, to do my job effectively. But it's just a great reminder of the little things you need to do to be an effective leader. I think, uh, you know, a couple things that, that really stood out for me. Uh, first is the number of people that I actually either worked with um, or you know, had some uh, interaction with on a board or something like that that were examples in the book. And, and I'm happy to say that my examples were all good examples of leaders. The people that I knew uh, were used as favorable examples in the book, which was great. But um, you know, some of the other things is uh, knowing yourself and being self-reflective. That's something you know, that, that you have to continually do. It's not a, I do it once, I, I know what my strengths and weaknesses are. It's almost uh, on a weekly basis, do you, do you sit down and say, what, what did I do really well this week and what, what didn't I do? And being honest with yourself in terms of you know, where you need to develop. And that was a, a great reminder. And then the, the one thing that I hadn't thought about you know, probably quite as much uh, uh, as I was reading the book is that overuse of something that's a, char a, a good character uh, thing can actually turn into a negative. And it seems kind of obvious, but when you say, you know, can you have too much integrity? And, and um, that one for me, you know, when you, when you start to become self-righteous and things like that, it can actually turn into a negative. And that was a good reminder that sometimes you know, you get off your high horse a little bit and, and you, you have to balance it with the other dimensions. So I think those were uh, some of the things that stood out for me in the book. Thank you. Sure. Rob? Uh, well, to, uh, to Cynthia's point, I think it's, uh, it's a great read. It's an easy read. I, I recommend it to you. Um, and, and just to pique your curiosity, um, Gerard spoke earlier about the importance of the interrelationship of the different elements of character. And one of the examples that's used in the book is the importance of, uh, or what happens when you have integrity without humanity. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave it to you to figure out what term uh, Gerard uses in the book to describe <laughs> that individual. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was excellent. But listen, um, uh, to the point that Cynthia makes, I don't think there's anything in the book that you say, aha, my God, uh, my eyes just opened. <laughs> but you do read the book and you say, yeah, absolutely, that's right. And for me, more than anything else, the book, uh, and I think this whole initiative, has given us language to describe what we all innately understand. Uh, we see it, uh, so most certainly in some of the high-profile examples mm -hmm. that uh, Gerard speaks to uh, and, and, his, uh, and his colleagues in the book, uh, and the very public character flaws uh, evident in some of those very public examples. But quite frankly, we see it very much in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, as a leader in a professional services firm, I see it in my business. I see it in my organization as I look at those that succeed and why and reflect on that. I see it in my profession. As, a, as an audit partner uh, in, my, uh, in my earlier days and, um, uh, and as an audit leader, I tell you what, when you reflect and begin to think on uh, some of the, the uh, failures, some of the near misses, mm -hmm. and you think about what contributed to those failures and those near misses, uh, quite frankly, I'm wondering whether we shouldn't put, and I'm, I'm quite serious, whether we shouldn't begin to, now that we have the language, actually reflect on some of the elements of leader character in our risk assessment mm -hmm. uh, for some of our other clients. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and we don't, uh, and I think this gives us the language to do that. The, the term that we're all very familiar with is the tone at the top. And to, to some extent, I think that has also kind of been shorthand uh, for not only what is the character of the leadership, but I think it also uh, reinforces again how important uh, walking the talk and talking the walk at the top of the house is for setting the tone of the organization. So leadership character or the character of leadership very much impacts the character of the organization, I think. Uh, and finally, what I found really eye-opening, um, the, the, the nature versus nurture uh, debate and, and how much of leadership character and, and the values and virtues, elements of that are innate in individuals 
Uh, but the point that's made very clearly in the book, and, and, and I think you've got me convinced, is that it, it can be taught, it can be learned, Absolutely. it can be destroyed yeah. uh, equally. In five uh, seconds. Uh, very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I loved your, your quote from Aristotle that we, we are what we continuously do. Yeah. Uh, and, and that uh, ability to reinforce and build character in the organization. So I thought it was excellent. Good. Thank you, Rob. Dean? Well, I would say um, the book is absolutely and, and immediately useful. So I interviewed a guy yesterday. I, I, I'm not as organized. Uh, uh, I read it uh, uh, starting on Monday. <laughs> and, uh, but, I, but it was an easy read. But, I, but, but I'm a quick reader, and it's an easy read. But, and on Tuesday, I was interviewing a guy, and I had all these characteristics in there front of me. Go. And you know, it actually, it actually changed the questions I asked the guy. And, it, and they were really interesting conversations yeah. around, tell me a story where you had to display courage, mm -hmm. a fork in the road, some big issue that you had to deal with. Tell me a story where you got knocked down and you had to get back up again, because it happens to all of us. So, so it's an interesting, immediately useful uh, set of, of concepts and tools. And I would like to come back to this question of language that uh, both Cynthia and Rob talked about. The language of performance is, there's, there's a whole science and an art there in it by itself. That's a subject of another book, I think. And you know, we, in Sun Life, we've changed the language of performance in the last four years, and we talk about hits and misses. We don't talk about successes and failures. And you know, just changing the language to hits and misses has fundamentally changed the nature of the conversation. So all of my reports to our board of directors, we frame in terms of hits and misses. And so it's changed the conversation. The board's not trying to, you know, gotcha, like find out where management's trying to pull one over them. It's, it's really hits and misses. You lay it all out. And then you talk about the misses and you talk about the, the hits. And we do that with our own people. And so this language around character, by the way, I think there's still an issue here. Because you you correctly said, Jared, the word character is a loaded word. and. It's one thing to develop leadership character. Maybe it's developing leadership characteristics. I, I still think there's, we're going to get stuck in this word character because it does have so much baggage attached yeah. to it. I think, I think we need to do more okay. work on that. Okay. Well, maybe that leads to kind of the second question here. So here we go. Uh, leader character is seen as critically important, but seldom explicitly <coughs> addressed or actually used by those in senior leadership positions in organizational processes, including selection, performance management, and renewal. And so Rob and or Dean, what explains the gap between knowing and doing, and what can we do about it? Well, we, we actually, when we you know, interview senior people, we put them through a battery of testing. And the testing actually does uh, pull out uh, leadership characteristics and, and touches on most, if not all, of these things. The challenge is to actually, um, it's, it's difficult just through a survey or through a <coughs> a process to actually understand how people stack up on these. Yeah, you almost need to be watching them and see how they've reacted to different stimuli in the past. But we, we actually use that in, in the initial onboarding of people. Where we fall down, and I think there's an opportunity, <coughs> is actually use it on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and like most companies, there's a lot of um, machinery around competencies. So. Yeah. Somebody says, how do I get from here to here? Okay, well, here are the competencies. They're well laid out. You do this, you do that. You can get from here to there. And we haven't done as much, at, and actually it's easy to do, uh, on leadership characteristics. Thank you. Yeah, Rob? I, I think to the very point that, uh, that you make, Gerard, it's awkward. It, it cuts to the heart of the individual. And, yeah. and so it's a, it's a subjective, it's an awkward conversation. I think having the language is a first step, but I think we still need to translate that into tools. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, and that's a little bit uh, to the point that, uh, that you make and that, that Dean makes, which is we have well-established tools and methodologies and questions and behavioral interviewing techniques relative to assessing on competencies. We now have the beginnings of that in terms of having some language. Yeah. But I still think people aren't going to say, so tell me an example of where you've been transcendent. Mm -hmm. uh, because people don't really understand <laughs> what we are <laughs> transcendent. Uh, so, so I think we still, we, we need to build out uh, the tools and the methodologies based around those elements of character. Yeah. So I think this is an important first step, but I still think there's some ways to go to get that equal place at the table yeah. with, I think, the well-established competency models that uh, I think most organizations use. 
good, very nice, thank you. Cynthia, so we have 11 character dimensions, right? And so which of those 11 dimensions do you believe is most difficult for senior leaders to accept? Mm -hmm. Why, and what can be done to change this? So um, as you said, we did get the questions in advance, and I thought about uh, it, and, and it was really hard to pull out just one, because I think you know, I've experienced leaders across the board that have you know, strengths in various, um, in various areas, and then they definitely have opportunities in each of these, um, these different, different dimensions. Um, but it, as I, I, if I pushed myself, I would probably say that over time, probably humility is the one that I think is hardest for leaders. Because generally, to become a leader, you've had some great successes. Um, you've delivered results. You kind of get a little, you get, you get a little full of yourself, I think. And, and so what I tend to see is um, that that part of humility uh, sometimes breaks down. People, um, I see, often mix up themselves personally and the role. And they forget the difference between the two of them. And I think it's an important thing that, you know, keep to who you are. The role is something that someday you won't have that role. Know who your true friends are, who the people that like you because of who you are as opposed to the role. And I, I find that sometimes as, as people um, in leadership positions forget that, that balance a little bit. So um, I think, I think uh, what you can do to, to, to make a difference is you know, constant feedback, um, whether people are delivering on results um, or not. The toughest ones is when, when people are actually hitting it out of the park. Um, and the results are there, people tend not to give the difficult feedback, even when they see that maybe they're not doing it the right way. They're not taking people with them as they deliver those results. That's the toughest conversation because everybody likes to you know, report good quarterly results or successes. And so if the person that's helping you do that, you know they're not necessarily doing it the right way, those are the, the toughest conversations. And so I think a commitment to ongoing feedback to make sure that you keep people's egos in check um, and you know, help them develop all of the characteristics is, is pretty important. Excellent. So maybe a question for the whole panel. This is one I struggle with. Why is it that some leaders who seem to have lack of character or are short of lots of character dimensions still rise to the top? Hmm. I thought about that one and again. Yes. Um, uh, and, and I reflected and I wonder whether uh, the, the shortage of certain of the character dimensions uh, might get compensated for through elements of competency dimension. So you, you think of the, uh, uh, the, the what, we, what we hear often <coughs> is that visually impaired people have an acutely developed uh, sense of hearing, uh, necessarily. Uh, and I wonder whether sometimes some of those competencies uh, get focused on and developed in the absence of some of the uh, character elements. Um, I think to the point that Cynthia makes, self-awareness, I think the other thing that happens is that as you rise to the top, and again, a lot of the competencies uh, will give you very strong near-term results, mm -hmm. uh, where, where character often comes into play in an important and a significant way, is when you hit those headwinds, when you, when you have the difficult moments. Um, and absent those difficult moments, as we see these people rise to the top, and the closer they get to the top, um, if they don't naturally have self-awareness, uh, what also happens is the emperor has no clothes and nobody calls out some of those character flaws. Uh, so those around them aren't giving them the necessary feedback around some of the dimensions of character that you're showing day to day. Um, if you don't naturally have self-awareness, you can do quite well until you hit some of those headwinds. And, and that's in the, in the very public example. Yeah. That's exactly what happened, I think. We had some really strong competencies, very, very bright people. But it's when you hit, hit the shoals right. that, uh, that the rubber hits the road. Thank you. I would actually um, describe this as um, not always a problem in the sense that, you know, I've promoted people in the past, in fact, I've been promoted in the past into roles where I actually didn't have, I was short of a lot of these character uh, attributes. And the question is not, you know, are you perfect, because nobody's perfect, but the question is how fat, what kind of trajectory are you on? So at any moment in time, every one of us is is working on these characteristics. So the question sort of says, how can you end up with people in leadership roles who are short? Everybody's short of these characteristics. So, so one of the questions is, you know, how fast can people learn them? What kind of trajectory are they on? Are they, are they open-minded? Are they getting the kind of feedback loops uh, that they need to, to keep raising their game? The other comment I'd make is, um, I contrast the, our current company from my prior life our current board, over the course of a year, 
would see about 200 uh, senior executives from Sun Life across the company, around the world. That's a lot of people. The board actually sees a lot of our talent. And when I contrast that to my prior company, um, there was very little interaction at the board level. So when it comes time to promote, and sometimes these are battlefield promotions, mm -hmm. so boards have to move quickly or leadership, leaders have to move quickly, in many cases um, the board needs to have done its homework and had a lot of exposure to people. Not uh, sure there's much more to add. I think that's a good point. I hadn't thought about it uh, uh, from Dean's perspective. That is true that I think you know, there isn't anyone that ticks every box as you move up. But, but I do think it, it, uh, in terms of there are some times when you know that a leader has, has been put into a position where it can actually have the negative because they've got there for delivering on results and they haven't, haven't done it the right way. And I think um, the points made in, in the book quite well, and I've seen it happen all too often, is that you know, if you pick those leaders and, and, and they have um, some real flaws in those characters, because you know, everyone has a little one, you know, or a little two, three, but big flaws, I think that will, that will really dictate the culture of the organization. And if, if bullying is, you know, is, is looked at as a way to continue because you're, you're, you kind of have the attitude of, I get results, but damn the torpedoes, I don't you know, kind of mind who I, who I take down along the way, but I deliver for you. And if those you know, people end up as your leaders in the organization, that is the culture, and I, I've seen it happen, that younger people say, well, that's my, that's my way to, to get ahead because it's an accepted way. So I think, um, I, I think but when it, I've generally seen that it does come to a halt when the results stop because then those flaws come out. And as soon as you don't deliver, uh, you know, everyone is, is kind of looking to say, uh, you know, help that person actually fail. So I think it is, you ride on the results, uh, and uh, uh, that can be very dangerous because when, it, when the results aren't there, uh, you certainly see the other flaws come out uh, very clearly. Excellent, good. Uh, Dean, question for you. How can young professionals market themselves as people of good character? Well, I'd come back to this, um, this interview example. Um, imagine you're in an interview for a job or promotion in your company, and somebody like me asks you these questions. So give me some stories, give me an example where you actually had to test some courage and, and demonstrate some courage. And I would self-test yourself on those questions and say, what, what have I done so far in my career that has, where I've had to confront one of these characteristics and I've been tested on it? And I'll tell you, just the act of kind of going through that process, which the book gets you to do, you can't read the book and not reflect on yourself and you know, the parts of your game that you're working on, It'll show anybody that you're talking to that you're very um, reflect, self-reflective, that you've thought about this, that you kind of have a good sense of, a good self-awareness of, of your own game and what you need to, to be working on in your own game. So that, that, would, be, that would be one point. Um, and then the other point I would raise is I, I would not hesitate to, uh, in your organizations, to actually take this framework and talk about it with people. You know, some of the big steps up I got in my career, I, I you know, I came to a session like this, I, I heard about some framework or something, and I took it back to the team and said, hey, well, we should be thinking about competition this way. And it's, you know, you've assumed people more senior than you know all this stuff already, but it's surprising uh, they don't. <laughs> so I would encourage, you know, people earlier in their careers to grab this and try to introduce it in your organizations. Great, great advice. Uh, Rob and Cynthia. Our research has shown that senior business leaders do not believe that the educational system does a good job of developing leader character in students, and that business schools need to address character issues more than they currently do. What suggestions do you have that will help business schools and their students to elevate the importance of leader character and to develop it in their students? Well, I personally, I think the, the business schools were primarily responsible for the financial crisis, frankly. So I think they've got a, uh, <laughs> they've got a long ways to go. Um, uh, um, but uh, uh, seriously, I do think that they have an important, <laughs> an important role to play. Um, uh, one of the, um, well, I, I think a couple things. So one, I loved in the book the, the concept of heroes in waiting. Uh, and, and developing in, in our future leaders uh, through the business schools. And I think actually, uh, quite seriously, I think the business schools have a very, very important mm -hmm. role to play, uh, both in reinforcing uh, through the case studies that they use, what, what is it we celebrate, uh, 
what business, what, what case studies we select uh, and the points that we're making through those. So for example, I've seen lots of business cases uh, in business schools on, uh, on whistleblowers uh, and looking, and, but, but what's the takeaway for most of those stories? That they did the right thing and their career failed uh, until they got on the speaker circuit, right? Um, so, so uh, and it's not to suggest that we don't talk about those right. things, but we gotta be really careful in terms of how we frame those right. and what gets reinforced. Uh, I think what we celebrate uh, and, and the stories that we celebrate and how we define the successes uh, is very much what, what young people then begin to emulate and believe is, is the, the leadership characters that lead to success in the business world. So I think there's a big, big role for business schools, but I think there needs to be a fundamental step back and relook at what are we trying to achieve. Uh, and if we're trying to build leaders of tomorrow, we got to start by looking at what do those leaders look like uh, and what are the attributes that we're trying to build and what's the self-awareness we're trying to build and the elements of self-awareness in those future leaders and then look at developing a curriculum. And, and the, the elements of character cannot just be taught in the ethics course, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So, so if this is in the ethics course, it's, yeah, okay, fine. That's, that's when, on my ethics day every year. Um, but this needs to be fundamental to, yeah. to the, the core curriculum, for I think. For all functions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and for all, yeah. for all functions. And I, I mean, I, I agree with Rob, it is critically important, uh, you know, that business schools really start to talk about it a lot more than they have. What I would say, though, you know, when I was reflecting on it, I, I don't, the, the environment isn't set up for it uh, in, in the way that makes it easy. Uh, it's highly competitive. Um, there isn't a common goal. I, I know that may sound odd. Of course, there's a common goal. Everyone wants to graduate, but there isn't. At a company, it's that, that at the end of the day, you, you all want to win as a company. You want to you know, gain market share. You want to grow sales. You want to grow profits. And so at least you have a common goal to bring people together. I see in, in the business school environment, it is highly competitive. Everybody's going after the job. I, I'm not sure it's as conducive to some of the leadership characters. But that doesn't mean that, that we stop trying and say, OK, it can't be done. And I do, I have a son right now who's in HBA1. Uh, and, and he has, uh, you know, he calls home a lot to talk about the different things that they're trying to do in terms of bringing in speakers that are really going at the heart of leadership character. Um, he, he absolutely loved the Michael McCain uh, video and the Listeria crisis and how Michael behaved in it. And it was a good message. Um, but also some of the speakers that have, have come in and, um, and spoke to them, I think, I think it was Tim Hockey from, from TD. Uh, that came in and talked about you know personal growth and leadership and and he found that fascinating that Tim you know this very senior executive at TD Bank would stand up and kind of open up and talk about his personal journey as a leader and um, and the feedback he had so I think some of those real life examples and seeing someone that is a highly successful um, uh, you know leader uh, in the business community and that it they failed at times and what they did with those failures and how they learned from it I think is really important in developing the character. But I do, I, I, I think the business schools still have a long, a long way to go uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the importance of leadership character uh, coming into a, a, a new job or an organization. It's time to get even, Rob. So, um, <laughs> follow-up question. You talked about the importance of cases. Um, that's, that's wonderful. But, you know, uh, all we do with cases is uh, talk. And uh, I wonder when it comes to leader character, I can, I can talk, we can have a conversation for about four hours, but at the end of the day, we actually didn't do anything to build your leader character. Are cases enough? And if the answer is no, then what else is it that business schools should be doing to build leader character in their students? I think it is, it is fundamental to how we define success. So I'll mm -hmm. go back to the yep. comment. Uh, if, if the success of a business school is measured by, and I think it is, mm -hmm. uh, is measured by the leaders that they help to develop, um, and you just look at uh, who you've got at this table, this is kind of defined, I'm not, I'm not uh, in that category, so I'll refer to my, uh, my fellow uh, uh, panelists here. Um, I think looking at what is that measure of success uh, is where it needs to start. It, it's sort of like defining a journey, and you always define that journey uh, by creating the vision of the endpoint having created that vision and articulated that vision and, and painted the picture of where it is you're trying to get to with an emphasis on some of the elements that we've been talking about here will very much change the journey in terms of how you get there. So it is different business cases yep. for sure, but I think that you need to have a context for that. And it's not just finding business cases 
that celebrate uh, elements of character. Right. I think it is a much more fundamental reassessment than that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dean, uh, leaders, leader character can be shaped. <coughs> And so what are some of the best ways organizations can help develop character in young professionals? Well, a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is that uh, if we take this framework and use it as, uh, as part of the whole performance feedback mechanism, I think that'll be one way, one very practical way. And, and uh, you know, in our, in our company, in our world, we talk about, again, it's back to the language of performance, we talk about uh, helping people raise their games. It's, it's all about coaching. It's all about, you know, nobody's perfect. And so we're all, you know, what part of your game are you working on? And hey, you didn't know you needed to work on this part of your game. Another, another aspect of the language of performance is we're, we're changing the culture to be polite but direct. You know, Canadians are too damn polite. Um, <laughs> We, we need to be a little more Dutch. Dutch. And, uh, <laughs> hey, careful oh. now. Oh, seriously, I say, that, oh, I say that with, with great admiration. We need to find a way. So that's what we're doing in, in the company, polite but direct. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. We'll, we'll be in a meeting and people will say, you know, uh, in the spirit of being polite but direct, they'll almost use it, and then they'll go on and say something that, you know, I completely disagree with what you're doing. Um, <laughs> but they're kind of using it as an enabling, you know, preface to what they're saying. So finding the right language to, to create a, a direct conversation, to have a coaching environment is, a, is the, our, our precursors to actually talking about these things and helping people with these things. I think the other big idea here is, is to tell stories. There's nothing more powerful, and, and it gets away a little bit, it's a bit like the case study in the business or organizational environment. And depending on what leaders talk about, the stories they pick, the way they tell them, the characteristics of leadership that they call out has a huge impact. And we try to do that in our place. We talk about, it's like sitting around the campfire talking about, you won't believe, you know, what now here's an example, in the 19, uh, in World War II, uh, Japanese invaded uh, Southeast Asia, our Philippines operation, um, it was kind of wiped out, everybody disappeared, and then after the war, no surprise, there's a lot of death claims that came in, and all of our documents, uh, all of our documents were gone, they were just destroyed in the war. And whoever was running the company at the day made a decision to pay every single death claim without any evidence, just paid it. And, and then a couple of years later, they were changing the office and they dug up the floorboards and found all the original, the, the manager had, had hidden all the policy documents uh, under the floorboards. And they were sent back to head office and guess what? Not a single case of fraud mm -hmm. among these things. So you tell that story and it's a story around some courage, it's a story around doing the right thing, it's a story around integrity, it's a, and when you tell that story, people listen, and they kind of get clues on what's important. So telling stories, I think, is really important. Excellent, thank you. Can I, can I just of course, pile yeah. on that? I, and I, I couldn't agree more. We, we tend to use this term, walk the talk, right. and, and yes, of course, so we need to make sure that as leaders we are demonstrating the yep. things that we claim value. But I think in the context of the issues that we're talking about here that are so subtle and are so personal, I think sometimes just walking the talk isn't enough. You gotta be talking while you're walking. Right. You need to be yeah, talking to walk. Point. You need to be describing uh, what it is that, and, and you're not gonna tell stories in terms of failures of character of, of an executive last week, obviously. Um, <laughs> but, but I think what we need to do is to talk about the decisions that are made when we celebrate successes. Uh, as we celebrate those successes uh, with stories, make sure that we articulate and use the language yeah. that we've been talking about here in describing what contributed to the success of those stories. And I think that then constantly reinforces uh, the, the messages that we're trying to get at. So I, I couldn't agree more, Dean. Uh, Cynthia, any other thoughts on kind of the role of, of senior <laughs> leaders uh, helping to shape the character of young professionals? Yeah, and just uh, a little bit, Rob said, uh, you know, we're not gonna highlight the mistake, you know, that the leader made last week. I actually think, um, and it's, it's been very effective, um, I've found for myself is, admitting that you did make a mistake and, and pointing it out because for sometimes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for yourself. So, um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, when you know, you've know you gone through a very stressful, you know, kind of situation, a deal closing or something like that, y you, you forget about all the 11 characters. They don't all rise to the top, unfortunately. But being reflective on it, and I think I've received some of the most positive feedback when I've gone back to people and said, you know what, I, I didn't handle that meeting 
as well as I, I could have. Um, and I think it, it kind of relieves everyone that y you've, um, that's, not, that's not meant to be a characteristic that you want to kind of continue to evolve throughout the organization. You want to shut it down right away because if you leave silence after not maybe handling a situation particularly well, then people think it's okay. And I, and I think it's, it's gone well if you just say, you know what, I, I didn't do a great, great job there. I wish I could do it over again. I can't, but I, you know, but I recognize I, I didn't do a great job. And I think that's really helped um, you know, kind of uh, develop ca uh, leader characteristics in, in younger people as they're coming forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rob, how can the importance of leader character be elevated at the board level? Because in many ways, they too set the tone of the organization oh, part through hiring the CEO. 100% through the hiring and the assessment yes. and what gets reinforced yeah. with the CEO. Uh, I think the boards have an important role to play. I think they have an important role to play in terms of their, their own competencies and, and the evaluation of the contribution of directors at that table. Uh, so I think some of those elements need to find their way into those conversations. Uh, but I think at least, if not more importantly, uh, they set the tone for what are we looking for in a CEO? Uh, so now, in fairness, now that we have the language, and, and we'll keep coming back to that, and I do think that that is such a subtle but such a fundamental uh, element of this, uh, now that we have the language, making sure that as we start to uh, look at succession planning uh, for the, the senior executive roles, and we start to define the competencies that we're looking for, we also define and articulate the character elements that we're looking for uh, as we uh, do that succession planning as we assess the performance of a CEO, uh, have those conversations. Maybe they're subtle. Perhaps you can't tie your comp plan directly to demonstrated character elements, mm -hmm. but you can most certainly uh, use that language in the conversations around the assessment of both your current CEO and your candidates for succession. And I think by constantly reinforcing that language, using those terms, uh, it reinforces it as uh, one of the key elements of what the board expects okay. from senior leadership. Okay, I know this is Rob's question, but if <laughs> I could, uh, is it okay if I no, go jump go on your it. question? <laughs> um, one of the things that Dean brought up, which I think is critically important for boards, I sit on the board of Empire Sobeys, the grocery chain, and one of the things that, that we really try to do is not just um, hear everything through the C-suite, because you really, you can't, get a, you can't get a really good indication of the culture unless you're, um, you know, you're going to stores, you're meeting with um, regional management teams and looking at the up and comers and really trying to understand a bit more about the culture because the C-suite to some extent, they're on their best behavior at board meetings. They're, everybody's presenting, everyone's polished, they've got their suits and their ties on. That doesn't really give you a good indication of the culture and whether the right leadership behaviors are actually um, you know, demonstrated throughout the organization. So we use it as uh, we're in the field, we go out to the field, we're really encouraged to meet with um, different people's, uh, people at all levels of the organization and I think that is critically important and to bring that feedback uh, back to the board level to make sure that the CEO understands that culture and those other, you know, kind of what some people deem as softer things are really important uh, to, to leadership uh, within the organization. Great. Uh, Dean, you're the CEO, you're also the chairman. Of no. The board. You're not. No. Okay. No. Um, well, good. Still, <laughs> good. good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's good, good governance. Still, good governance. still. <laughs> how should you deal if you're such a firm believer? You're the yeah. CEO. Yeah. How should you deal with a board member who you believe does not demonstrate one or more of these eleven important yeah. character dimensions? Yeah, you know, our our view is that uh, the board should be subjected to the same kind of feedback and expectations, high performance expectations that we expect of our own employees. And so that uh, requires a very strong chair. We're fortunate we've got a very strong chair at the Sun Life Board. And he, he will sit down with directors and have very direct, polite, but direct conversations with them about areas where they need to work on some one of these characteristics. And that's the essence of it. They ju there just has to be a conversation. There has to be some feedback. And if it doesn't fix itself, and if it's a material problem, then there has to be a change in the director, ultimately. And I think that the, the key thing is just to tackle it head on, just like we do within the, within the company. Uh, and, uh, and a related piece, kind of backing up a step, is we've, um, we have a, a, a kind of a mantra that every single person we hire in the company must upgrade the average. Mm -hmm. 
when you think about that, you know, we're 18,000 people and 10% turnover and you go out and hire 1,800 people a year. Just imagine if we are able to upgrade the average every single time, what will look like in five years. It's, it's a very simple thought, hard to do, takes longer to find people. We've applied that same mantra to the board of directors. So we've got this sort of sense of we're continually trying to raise, on average, the quality of the board. So here then a follow-up question for Cynthia and Rob, and this is one of the things that we heard loud and clear through our conversations with the members of the Institute of Corporate Directors. There could be resentment regarding uh, the organization and its HR processes focusing or bringing into the conversation leader character, because in a sense it might seem that you question people on their character, right? It's a loaded word. So uh, how do we get around that? Uh, I think the first mistake would be if this is an HR-led exercise. Uh, so, um, but I understand the point, yeah. of course, that they'll, they'll be managing the process. Um, but I think the point is this, this can't be an HR process. Mm -hmm. This needs to be led from the top. And it can't just come out of, uh, come out of the blue right. that uh, when you are looking to get promoted to uh, C-suite, now character matters. Um, so this needs to, I think there needs to be a change management exercise, as with all fundamental change where we begin to build the case uh, within the organization for why character matters. Uh, and quite frankly, character matters at every level in the organization. It has a bigger impact on the organization the more senior you become through that organization. Uh, and the importance of character versus competency versus commitment, you might argue, changes. But fundamentally, uh, I think the message needs to start to come out that this is fundamental to how we define ourselves, our success, and how we are going to achieve our, uh, achieve our strategies. Uh, when you do that, and that has to be articulated from the C-suite led by the CEO, then HR is simply implementing uh, what they are all hearing from senior leadership. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, I didn't, I didn't see resentment actually. I, I see it as um, that organizations are kind of crying for this a little bit be, because I think that what you see more often is someone uh, either being hired or being promoted that doesn't have the characteristics, and you, you kind of. You go, really, is that, you know, what, what does that send, uh, what kind of message does that send to the rest of the organization? So I think organizations are ready for this. They want this. They see the examples of, uh, you know, people that are lacking, you know, some key characteristics. And, and it actually, I think, is a little bit disempowering when someone like that gets promoted. So I think people will be pleased to have leadership character matter when it comes to hiring and promoting. Okay. Thank you very much. And so final question for the entire panel. And so here we go. What challenges do you see in implementing character-based initiatives in, the organiza in organizations in the public, private, and not-for-profit sectors? And how can we address some of these challenges through research? I actually don't see a big difference in across the sectors. Okay. I, mean, I mean, all of these leadership characteristics are important. Yeah. I, I'm on the board of University Hospital Network, a uh, fantastic institu institution based in Toronto, and it, um, uh, I see these, the conversation around the table touches on all these characteristics all the time. So sometimes they're more difficult to advance mm -hmm. in if, uh, you know, if you don't have budgets or you know, if, if, um, uh, for other reasons, but, but the, I think the characteristics in, are just as relevant in, in the public sector and in the not-for-profit mm -hmm. sector as they are in the private sector. Uh, I agree, and I think consequently the, the steps that needs to be taken by, by, by management and embedding that in their organization are fundamentally the same. I, you look at, uh, at Michael McCain and how he responded to the, uh, to the Listeria crisis. Um, you may not have that in a, in a, in a public sector organization, mm -hmm. where you're going to have a similar crisis yeah. and the issues are going to be exactly the same about humility, about integrity, about uh, taking responsibility for your actions. Um, right. So I think the lessons uh, will show themselves in different ways, but fundamentally at its core, okay. I think these are core elements of leadership that are absolutely as applicable and yeah. consequently how you reinforce it right. is probably very parallel. True, but you also said this was kind of a change initiative, and we think about change initiatives, uh, one thing I know is that many of them simply derail. Mm -hmm. And so what is the likelihood or what are the risks with kind of bringing leader character into the organization from a change management point of view? See any, any obstacles that we need to address? I, I see the biggest, oh sorry, are you ready? Okay, Go one of the challenges um, is just, uh, you know, sometimes decoupling results from leadership character, and I, I see that as, um, 
is, is probably one of the biggest uh, biggest challenges because you know it, it you know where I keep stressing you see people promoted that deliver on results that don't have leader character I think the opposite could be said if someone isn't delivering on their results and yet gets promoted because they're you know demonstrating a lot of the other key elements so I think it's a challenge because you know the combination of things doesn't necessarily turn into results right away um, and and you have to I think be patient with it and I think people will you know, lose a little bit of patience if, um, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think, unfortunately, results kind of trump. You can't go, you know, too many years without delivering on the results before you say, eh, is this leadership character stuff really, right. really working? Because we're, we're not seeing a change in how we're performing in the marketplace. So I think linking it to performance is, is just going to be a challenge if it doesn't come right away. But that, that's the fundamental element of change management. Exactly. Right? You need to build the case. Yeah. Oh, totally. Uh, and, I agree. And it's not about being good it. people. Yeah. Right. It's, it's about how leadership character contributes to Actually, success and failure. Totally. Building that business case in the context of the organization, but the, the concept is the same. And that's typically the question. The first question we get, show me that it matters. Right. 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 So where, where's the evidence? Where's the hard data that you can actually relate leader character to improved organizational performance? Right. Now we know anecdotally, but also empirically, that right. information is there. We just have to more uh, convincingly present it. I'm Any reminded. Final word? Yeah. I, I, well, I'm reminded of. A, I got to tell another story. I'm yeah, reminded yeah. of a case <laughs> a year, number of years ago where we had this leader. It's really to Cynthia's point, who was producing unbelievable financial results in their part of the business, and they were extremely hard on the team underneath them. And I was living in Calgary. I moved back to Toronto. I took over this group. And, and I had a lineup of people outside my door saying, man, I just can't. I go home at night and I'm physically ill because of the pressure I'm under working on this team. And this, but this was a big financial engine. It was you know, generating a lot of the profits and a lot of the growth. And, and the business was being challenged from all kinds of angles. And uh, I remember, and so we tried everything. We tried working with this person got a coach, got feedback. I sat down, here's a piece of paper, here's what people have actually said. You know, no names, but like black and white, and they couldn't believe it. They didn't, just didn't get it. So after six months, said, that's it, we, we're gonna have to pull the plug and ask them to leave. So I remember sitting down with a law firm trying to get some advice on severance. And the guy said, wait a minute, let me understand this. You got somebody who's one of the, your most uh, productive financial man, you know, driving a lot of business, a rainmaker, clients love this person, and you want to fire them because they're a little hard on people. And I said, yeah. He said, you've just described half, described half my partners. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so it, what, was, what was interesting about it, so we went ahead, we, we terminated this person's <coughs> employment, and it's kind of like, the, it's like you have a bush, and it did get smaller, the revenue fell, it looked like hell for about six months, but then it grew back three times bigger. And the reason it grew back was we, we started getting calls from people in the industry saying, you know what, I really like to join you guys, but I never wanted to come there because of that person. Yeah. I never would have joined the team because of that person. So it's, um, it's an example where, to really, to Cynthia's point, where you have to find the courage, I guess, to kind of marry the business results and but doing it the right way. I like the way you put that, Cynthia. Right so. Great story, thank you for sharing that. Well, you've been very patient, and so we have a good uh, 20 minutes to uh, answer or address uh, your questions. And so, as I said at the outset, we have uh, one or two microphones, right? So uh, if you have a question, please signal, and either Ivan right, or Don will have the microphone. Thank you. Um, that was a great panel. Thank you, guys. Uh, my question is probably primarily for Rob. You touched on it a little bit in terms of what is the role of a business school. So right now, business schools are basically graded on two things, their number of placements and their average salary. Um, that's what students Google before they go to the school. Um, and that's what career management basically builds their case on. What incentive do you think we can give to business schools to maybe not focus on those really short-term numbers and instead look at like the number of leaders or the number of people in leadership positions? Well, I would start with a, uh, a research project that I would get Gerard all over because uh, he's <laughs> demonstrated he, uh, he knows exactly how to do this. Uh, I think your point's well taken. Um, so it's a little bit how do they attract the, the best of the brightest and what goes in has a big impact on what comes out. Uh, then it's a little bit uh, uh, in terms of how do you then uh, 
train, uh, develop, uh, impact the perception of what matters in, in the business world. Um, uh, there's not an easy answer, to be clear, uh, and, and I think the business schools are run as businesses uh, in that respect as well. Uh, so I think looking at what are the KPIs that they are establishing to measure their success is the same thing as we do in our business, uh, and looking at what are the KPIs, the, the key performance indicators that we use to measure our own success. And I think that's part of what needs to be revisited, but that's a, that's a, that's a challenge. Thank you, uh, great panel discussion. My question is for Dean. Um, I love your story. Thank you for sharing your stories. Um, uh, so you talk about nobody is perfect and we always work on different attributes and talk about it's very important to focus on the trajectory where you're going. Uh, maybe you can share with us maybe one example you have done, um, you know, looking back at your career, something you have been uh, working on develop some mm. characteristics. Thank well, uh, yeah, I, I can. If you had a couple of hours, I can tell you how I'm working on all these things here. Um, the, uh, well, I would, uh, I would call out one, um, it, and the, the neat thing about, the, I love this framework, by the way, the neat thing about it is you can actually pair some of them. So at one point in my career, I was too temperate and not courageous enough. So. Um, I remember somebody saying to me, you know, we, we really need to know where you stand on this issue. Like, you're kind of, you're very, you know, balanced and you're thoughtful and blah, 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 but what do you actually think? Like, what's your view? Like, take a stand on it. And I thought that was, I mean, it was great coaching feedback. And my employees today would tell you, that's not a gap. There's other things that <laughs> work. Yeah. They know exactly where I stand on things, so. So that, that was one. There's, I could give you all, I could go down the list. There's been so many, like Cynthia's uh, point around, you know, we're, we're all working on things and there's lots of misses over the course of the year and, and it causes you to want to work on something, so. But you raise an important point, right? I think leaders, in particular senior leaders, on a daily basis, they must see opportunities to coach, to guide, or yeah. sometimes to mentor junior people. Yeah. And I think too often we let these opportunities slip by. Yeah, right? yeah, that's right. Um, and, and I think the, the, the framework you have to get into is one of coaching in the moment, yeah. you know? And it's, it is, I like that coaching thing because it, it takes the judgment out of it. You're not being judgmental, you just say, it's kind of like sports or music or something, you know? And it, I'd love to be able to hit a golf ball better than I do. I'd love for somebody to tell me to <laughs> do this a little bit differently. And that's how you, if you, if that's the spirit, uh, and as you said earlier, Gerard, that it's not mean-spirited at all. It's you're really trying to help people. Yeah. And you know, the other thing, other thing I'd say in this, intent counts more than technique. <laughs> like people will get it. Like if you're really trying to help them, they will see it in a heartbeat. Even if you don't get the words exactly right, they will see it in a heartbeat. Intent counts more than technique. Great quote, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, thanks for speaking with us today. My question is around um, something that a few of you had said earlier on about how character matters the most during times, tough times. And so, you know, we're thinking about global economic uncertainty right now. There's a lot of business leaders in the room who are probably feeling a lot of pressure in their own organizations. I'm curious to know, and this is a question for any one of you, curious to know, how does your leader character show up for your people during these times of uncertainty? Good question. Um, yeah, I can kick it off, and I'm sure uh, the panelists will have some other uh, good comments. But um, you know, just in terms of, uh, there's a tendency to be a little um, looking for short-term solutions, and maybe you know trying to you know find. Uh, you know, little, little short-term things that will help you get through this tougher time. And, and I think the message that I'm trying to deliver is don't get focused on the quarters, don't get focused on the short-term, because I think it can lead you to, to make decisions that are not in the best interest, the long-term best interest of the organization. There are things that are outside of your control, and I'm not saying ignore them and put your head in the sand and, not, uh, and pretend they're not happening. But don't get caught up in the pressure of delivering on short-term things. You, you have to have the resilience. You have to have the courage to, to say, yeah, we, we didn't hit it out of the park this quarter. And that's OK. Here's what we're doing about it. Um, and, uh, and just you know, have the confidence to, to stay, stay the course. 
um, because there is a lot of pressure when you, you know, when you look every day and your unit price or your stock price isn't going the way you want it to go. It, you know, we're all, uh, you know, for the most part, I think people are, we're built to win and we like to win and so it's just not getting too tempted by trying to do short term things. So I'm really trying to send that message across. Don't, no knee jerk reactions to things that you think will help us in the short run that could derail us in the long run. Well, and I think in the context of uh, we need to have all these things in balance. Uh, I think it is also, an, and uh, I forget who made the comment in terms of never let a good crisis go to waste. <laughs> um, we also need to, and what I'm encouraging our people to do is to have the courage to make those difficult decisions that we need to make with humanity. Uh, and and, and, and I, maybe this is where transcendence comes into, uh, into perspective, uh, taking the long view, understanding the broader <laughs> context, but having the courage to take what are sometimes some, some very difficult decisions. So there, there are elements of each of those elements of leadership character that come to the fore, I think, in terms of their importance at various stages uh, in, in your career and at various mm -hmm. stages uh, of, uh, of what your business yeah. is facing. Uh, but there's no question they're all going to get tested uh, in Canada over the next, and have been, and are going to continue to get tested uh, uh, in Canada over the next few years. We've got, uh, we got some choppy waters ahead. Gerard, you've got one, one of your um, uh, drivers uh, is, is drive. Yeah. One of the, the characteristics is drive. And there's a word underneath that that I think needs to be added to the discussion, which is resilience. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, full steam ahead, drive, push, achieve goals. It's resilience. And, you know, businesses sometimes have tailwinds and sometimes have he headwinds. And we are, in many markets, in many industries, hitting a period of, of headwinds. And organizations, you need to understand that they're, they're kind of like, they're big organisms and they need to have resilience and people need to have resilience because it's like we're cycling into a 30 kilometer an hour headwind <laughs> at for, could be for quite a while. So you have to think about how do you build resilience uh, in yourself, in organizations, um, taking a longer term view and, uh, and keeping people focused and keeping people energized. So I, I think resilience is, one aspect is one ca leadership characteristic that I think is underplayed. Because in every leadership job, there's that, so what's that song? I get knocked down and then I get up again? <laughs> That's my theme song. I get knocked down and get up yeah. again. You've got to have resilience. So, yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. And then we, Don, we have, oh, somebody in the well, back here. Ladies first. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm wondering about uh, diversity and inclusion. We're all trying to build increasingly diverse and inclusive workplaces. And when I saw your dimensions of uh, character that were put up, um, I'm thinking about the fact that those look different in different cultural contexts. And I'm wondering if you've reflected on how to assess and coach against those um, in the context of cultural difference. So for example, humility might look very different to me than it might to you and how that would manifest itself. So I wonder if you can comment yeah. on that. It's a great question. No, it's a great question and not meant to be a cop-out, but um, we actually now having this, this survey that we're gonna administer in different cultures or different parts of the world and to see to what extent people believe this particular dimension is actually uh, detrimental or helpful, right, to the success of a leader in the organization. So that speaks to kind of the importance. Uh, what it might look like in terms of behavioral terms, because the instrument that we have developed is not simply word and we ask how do you re respond to. It is actually behavioral statements that we developed again through a lot of interactions with uh, organizational leaders in Canada and elsewhere. But you're right, you know, I do a lot of work in, in Asia and humility might look very different than uh, what it is here in North America. Not there yet. Having said all of that though, and remember, you know, that is how uh, Aristotle or Peterson and Seligman looked at these virtues. A virtue is not really a virtue if it's virtuous in uh, Europe but not in North America. I mean, we know that these things generalize across time, across religions, across cultures, right? that's what we know. But how people give meaning to right, those words, I agree, might look a little different, but we're not there yet. It's on the radar screen. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, um, 
uh, actually a comment uh, and a question, a comment I think is better than I can give. Um, when I, I, I love storytelling. So I came to this country around 15 years ago or so. I came from Colombia and uh, I arrived in November. They told me Canada is cold. <laughs> 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 and I said, really? I'm going to get prepared. I put on my leather jacket. <laughs> 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 when I came to this country, I realized that the word cold could have completely different <laughs> definitions <laughs> based on where you are and based on your experience with your exposure. So think with that. The question, <laughs> <laughs> trying to be uh, polite but direct. <laughs> so uh, we're talking about leadership character and uh, my question is uh, how can uh, we make sure that that leadership character is actually embedded in the culture of the organization? So what is, uh, if you have to do things again, if you have to do, if you have the opportunity to do things differently, what would you do differently to actually make sure that that leadership character is embedded uh, in the organization? It's a question of culture of the organization. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I think the, um, it starts by uh, taking this framework and figuring out how to, how to actually make it part of the vocabulary of the organization. And by the way, one of the other challenges in that is that no organization is standing still. At any point in time, there's a million other things you're trying to get done. So introducing a new, a, a new framework into an enterprise is, a, is you got to think about how to do that so that it actually has impact. Um, but, but assuming you can get that done, uh, then I think it comes down to, it's just not enough, to Gerard's point, it's not enough to put the words out there. It's not even enough to train people on what it means. It's all about walking the talk and talking as you walk and I like that, that's talking as you walk and, and, uh, and actually backing it up with actions. So, you know, if, if somebody is not displaying integrity, you deal with it. Because the worst thing you can do is put this framework out there and say, hey, this is really important. And then to ignore, condone, allow uh, inappropriate behavior and action on these dimensions to to persist. So I, I don't think it's more complicated than that, but it, it's hard to do. In terms of what I would do differently, if that was part of the question, uh, and I think it's exactly the point that Dean makes, it is uh, what it is we allow, what we don't call out, what we walk past. Uh, and, and whether it's on the dimension of, of humility or, or that w when we see failures uh, or flaws um, and we don't uh, take out that leader in Calgary uh, as you did and allow that per to perpetuate, then that becomes what we, what we regularly do and that becomes who we are. So if I had to do things over again, so to speak, it, it's calling it out sensitively, which is hard for a Dutchman, sensitively, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, but that's probably, from where I sit, one of the toughest things <laughs> to do when you have a successful partner in, in my world uh, or a successful, uh, a successful leader, but that is uh, not, behaving in a way aligned with your corporate values or showing, uh, showing the elements of character that we, uh, that we claim we cherish. Well, you have three in a row, because mine was exactly the same, that um, having the courage to deliver the feedback earlier in my career, because I probably you know, just, just should have uh, been more direct with it. And now, I, I, you know, at, at the end of most performance reviews, even if I have a superstar, I say, you know what, I, I'd be shortchanging you if I didn't talk about the things that I, that I think you can do better, uh, even if you're a superstar. And so I work really hard to make sure that you know the little the little things in terms of feedback, so that they can continue to develop as a leader. That I talk about those, and we have a good conversation on them. And early in my career, I probably it was easier to have a good conversation. It's tougher to have the challenging conversation. And so I probably took took the easy way out early on. I would do it differently and have more courage and deliver the feedback up front. Great, thank you. On the right. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for your thoughts. They've been uh, really helpful. Uh, so we mentioned earlier, you've talked a lot about, uh, all three of you, uh, about self-reflection and really understanding what leadership character you uh, possess. My question is, what tools and programs did you use to assess those characters, and what tools and programs would you recommend organizations use? 
Well, we, we use some 360-degree um, feedback tools and some psychological testing tools, as I said earlier, at, at the point of entry when people join the firm. Um, we also back test those. It's kind of interesting. You go, you go along and you say, okay, we've hired all these folks. They came through these tools with these particular scores and characteristics. And then we actually see them in the workplace. And we see some have been great, great successes and some have been not as successful. So then we go back and look at the tools and say, well, wh are there some predictors um, in the way we're screening people and, and uh, <coughs> letting people into the company? Are there some of the, the things that we need to change and, or emphasize more in terms of predicting future performance? Um, but I, I would say we have a lot of work to do. There's not really there's not really great tools to measure these characteristics. It's more anecdotal. It's more observational. And um, I think that's actually a big, a big opportunity for somebody to figure out how to bring some more measurement to it. If I could make some uh, shameless promotion <laughs> to the work that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that we do, and I'm going to refer you to those two gentlemen in the back, David and Marty, if you can just raise your hand, because I know that you've been working with it quite a bit. Uh, through our research, we developed an instrument, as we talked about before, the Leader Character Insight Assessment. It's very behaviorally based. Behavior is good because it's observable, right? We, we, we can talk about behavioral incidents. Uh, if you want to know more about it, just talk to those two gentlemen, right? There, there is a tool. It's uh, available in self-assessment as well as 360, and it comes, I think, with some great information to help people think, reflect, and then redirect their behavior. All right, we have two more questions. So, uh, lady in the back, and then you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I wanted to come back to the topic of diversity. Um, and we've talked a lot about developing leadership characteristics in individuals, but not as much about you know, developing character um, of a team. And I'm wondering your perspectives on the role that, that diversity can play uh, in that. And I think it's a real challenge, because if I reflect on um, my MBA class and what I look at the st statistics still today, you know, on the gender perspective, um, it's still a real challenge. We have um, far less than half of our classes of women, and um, I think it's true of other diversity categories as well. So I'd love to hear your perspectives on that. Yeah, I, I, um, I think the, uh, we have a, a lot of work underway in, at Sun Life on diversity and inclusion, and around the world we operate in 26 countries. So the question earlier about how does this work and how does it translate resonated with me. That, uh, that's something that we're, we're working on. Um, one way we work on it is we get people to work together across boundaries. And we, when we cr construct a task force, so we, last year we put together a task force uh, on what happens if interest rates stay low for not just three, four, five years, but 25 years. What does that mean for an insurance company like Sun Life? In constructing the task force to look at it, and these task forces, this is some of the most interesting, impactful work you can get involved with in a company. We, we went out of our way to make it a diverse task force, um, uh, gender and uh, ethnic background diversity, because we, think we'll, we actually think we'll get better answers and more interesting interchange. And the other thing is people will understand where other people are coming from to a greater extent. Um, and if they, if they so we've, we've taken people out of their, their home teams and putting them with people they'd never worked with before and uh, in kind of a different setting and ask them to solve a big complex problem uh, and we're doing more and more of that in the company. We get them to come and present to our executive team. And in, in the case of the low for long interest, they actually presented to our board of directors. So, uh, so the, we're using that uh, format in Sun Life to try to do a whole bunch of things: diversity and inclusion, get to better answers, and also give people some great uh, career opportunities. So, um, you know, I, I, it, it's a tough one that you know it's talked about. Uh, you know, so frequently, and then I think it was last year uh, in in board games, or whether it was out just before board games, when it still talked about the percentage of you know kind of board of directors that had no women on the board. So even though it is top of mind and it's very topical, it it doesn't. Uh, we still haven't had the impact I think that that um, that we need to have. Um, in the book, it does talk about, and and I, you know I think everyone recognizes the importance of it that. Um, you know, if you, and I've been in organizations that are a bit of both, that you know, they, they hire people that look alike, they talk alike, they act alike, they dress alike, and then you do get a bit of groupthink. 
um, because everybody comes with a little bit of the same perspective. So I have worked in that environment. And then I, I worked in another environment where all the leaders, if you went across the map of dimensions, which we have a copy in front of us here, a little cheat sheet, um, each of us were probably good at a few of them and missing a few of them. Um, and we were so different in the perspectives that we brought uh, to the table that we made way better decisions as a result of it. Because someone would come up with something, and I'm like, that, that never even crossed my mind, because they're just, they're just such a different background, different experience. Um, and you know, and we really it really delivered on the business results. So I think if, if people understand that diversity isn't just something you say because it's the right thing to do, it actually does, in my opinion, translate into better business decisions, better results. And so I just think we need to keep getting that message uh, out there. I also believe that some of those character dimensions actually might facilitate or help. You know, if you think about the things around collaboration and the importance of open-mindedness, which is an aspect or element of, uh, of collaboration, that's what you would need. If you think about uh, humanity and this notion around compassion and understanding, I think that's something that you would need in order to make uh, diversity work. If you think about uh, humility, right? Uh, without humility, I mean, no team will work effectively. So I think there's a number of aspects in terms of leader character dimensions and the supporting elements that would for sure uh, facilitate or encourage uh, diversity and to make diversity work in, uh, in organizations. Final question, make it a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's uh, so much a question as a observation, but a lot of boards have, and it's the diversity issue again, the boards have finance people, lawyers, operations, but very rarely do you have a human resources person on a board. Oh, sorry. Oh, OK, thank you. Very rarely do we have anybody on a board with a human resources background. And yet I heard this panel say today, well, we'll get HR to deal with that. They have expertise in culture. They have expertise in executive compensation. They have expertise in benefits, pensions, change management. And yet you exclude them, or no, they have not traditionally had a seat at the board because they aren't considered at that level. And yet that's where you go for your expertise in making these changes. And when you go to your organization and say, we want to implement this program, where do you go? And yet, and, and an example I'd like to give, and mind you, it was before the financial crisis, but there was a very successful CEO um, named Alan Dunlop. And he was the chairman of Sunbeam. And he got a nickname, Chainsaw Al. Other corporations hired him because he was very successful. Did he really have the cultural values that you want to bring to your organization? And in the end, he was seen as fraudulent. But perhaps a sober second thought from HR on a board may have helped when you're evaluating these um, criteria. So it's really more of a an observation than a um, question. And I thank you because I think this was a wonderful um, discussion. Um, I love the stories and um, can't wait to read the book. So thank you. All right. Well, on that note, I would like to. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want to respond. <laughs> I think it's a fair comment. It's yeah, fair. I do yeah. too. Yeah. I, I yeah. agree. I think we, uh, <coughs> I would take issue, I think we have HR consultants uh, in the form of comp consultants on the board frequently, but that uh, kind of reinforces your matter. point. That's not the competency we're looking for here. Mm -hmm. so but I have, good observation. And, but I have seen it come up much more as a topic now as we're looking at competencies and going through, you know, you, you do see it as a void. And so I know at least on Sobe's Empire piece of it, we have brought in someone that has much more of a people kind of HR background. So I think it's a great point and needs to continue uh, in diversity the same way some of the other elements of diversity. On that note, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to uh, bring the session uh, to a close. I'd like to do two things. First of all, I'd like to take uh, the panel, uh, Dean, uh, Rob, and, and Cynthia, for their time in, uh, in reading the book, uh, preparing for the session, and actually being here this morning, and for your very insightful answer. So thank you so much. Thank you.